Well, good morning, Westlake. I am so sorry that I and my family aren't able to be with you guys. Know that uh, we're missing you. Uh, we greatly, greatly appreciate uh, all the prayers and the outreach that you've done over this past week. I am very happy to say um, that most of the family is fully recovered and uh, Diane and I, we're, we're well on the road to recovery. So uh, we look forward to being back with you uh, next Sunday. But as we uh, dive into God's Word this morning, we're going to step out of our series uh, that we've been doing through the letter of 1 John. And we're going to talk about uh, what I think is the most comforting aspect of knowing God. And that's this, that God is sovereign. That is that God's in control. Now, please understand, it doesn't mean that everything's going to always be easy or it doesn't mean, mean that things are always going to make sense. But it does mean uh, that a good, loving, gracious, merciful, and just God who is for his children is working all things out for his glory and for our good. It also means that there's a purpose to everything that happens in life as well as in this world. And it means that God can even take what's meant for evil and he can turn it around and use it for his children's good. This is the beauty of the sovereignty of God. If you have your Bibles, I hope that you'll go to Psalm 115 with me as the uh, one big thing for uh, this morning is going to be this. That God being in control means that everything has a purpose and it's working according to his will for his glory. And his children should praise him for it. So let's look at it together. Again, Psalm 115. We're just going to start with the first couple of verses here. And so it says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens, and he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you for this morning and this opportunity to meet, uh, albeit on less than ideal circumstances. Uh, but God, I thank you that you are our healer. I thank you that uh, you are bringing our family through uh, this difficult time. Pray, God, for continued rest and healing and that we as the body of Christ can again gather together. Father, for those who are watching on live stream as well as those that are watching um, in person this morning. God, we just pray that you would speak to us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the truth of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, we're talking about the sovereignty of God. The God being in control means that everything has a purpose and it's working according to his will for his glory. And we as his children should praise him for that. So there's a few truths in this text that relate to God's sovereignty. Because God is sovereign, we can see that he should be praised for his faithfulness. Now, Psalm 115 is part of what is known as the Hallel Psalms or the Hallelujah Psalms. Uh, they're recorded there in Psalms 113 through 118. The Hallelujah Psalms are about praising God for who he is and what he has done. Uh, these would have been the psalms that would have been recited and sung by Jesus and his disciples uh, the night of the Last Supper. So there's a very strong connection between Jesus and these five psalms here. So again, because God is sovereign, he should be praised for his faithfulness. And so it's right there in verse uh, 1. See, what's unique about these hallelujah psalms is that we don't know who wrote them, but we can see in the very opening of Psalm 115 the point of it all. The author wants us to praise God and for God to receive all the glory for everything because it's rightfully His. 
God should be praised according to verse 1 for his mercy and for thy truth's sake. Now, for God to be merciful means that he doesn't give us what we deserve. We can see what we deserve and why we deserve it there in verses 4 through 8. And we'll come to them uh, here in just a little bit. But God has every right to give us his judgment because of our sin, and yet he doesn't, which should lead us to ask the question, well, why? The psalmist says, for thy truth's sake. It's another way of saying, because of your faithfulness. See, ever since the Garden of Eden, God has been showing his faithfulness to his promise. That very first promise ever given in scriptures, Genesis 3.15. It's a promise from God that says one day he is going to send a redeemer to redeem, to save his people. And that one day God is going to make all things right. Even, I mean, in just that first promise there, God is saying things aren't always going to be right, but one day he's going to make them all right. And that promise forms the basis of God's mercy. He hasn't wiped out all of mankind. Why? Because he has promised to save some, and that's what he is doing and what he's continuing to do to this day. And the only appropriate response to God's mercy, uh, when we understand his holiness and our sinfulness, the only proper response uh, to this is to praise him and to give him the glory for who he is and, and what he has done in being our substitute. Because God is sovereign, his ways are unquestionable. We see this in verses 2 and 3. The pagan nations around Israel, they're mocking Israel, going, where is your God? Where is your God? Uh, that's because you know they have all their false gods and their statutes and, and stuff, and they're saying, well, Israel's worshiping a God that can't be seen. Yet remember, Okay, back to just a little bit ago. This psalm has a strong connection into Jesus, who, according to John 1, is God. And, of course, Paul writes in Colossians 1 that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So the the psalmist is going, oh, you can see God because the Redeemer has come, and therefore you should give him glory. But there's really something else going on behind this. Uh, that that questioning of verse 2. And it's something that we see even in society today. People often wonder when tragedy strikes, where is God? Why did God allow this to happen? You know, uh, events such as 9-11, Hurricane Katrina striking in 2005, mass shootings, the uh, condo collapse down in Miami just a, a month or so ago. Uh, People often question the goodness of God when children get cancer or or when they die. Uh, They question the goodness of God when when they're trying to live a a Christian life, but their marriage is struggling or they lose their job or or things just aren't going their way, right? Uh, My guess is probably everybody watching this at some point has had a question at least faintly go through their mind. Why God? The truth is we judge based on what we see. What we perceive as good or bad or right or wrong. Yet verse 3 in our text reminds us that God is in the heavens. Now, that's the psalmist way of saying that God is seated high above all. All He is in the ultimate position of sovereignty and authority. That God and God alone is in that sole position of authority and being in control. You know, let us remember that Jesus said it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is that God is the standard of right and wrong, good, bad, righteous, and unrighteous. And his plan is for and with eternity in mind. Now, our plans are often based on what we believe is 
what would be our own good based on what we see, the limited knowledge that we possess, and really based on what we think is going to make us happy in that moment. I mean, if it was up to us, we would never suffer as long as we love God, right? In our limited understanding, we struggle to see the blessing and the benefits of of suffering. That's why uh, verses such as James 1, 2 to 4, this has counted all joy, brothers, when you fall into various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have her full effect, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. James is saying, listen, if you want to grow spiritually and and become spiritually mature, then you need to go through trials. You need to go through tribulations. Uh, The apostle Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. For this light momentary affliction, which is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. See, we don't We don't look at things in this life as light or momentary. We often judge all of life based on this one moment, this one fixed point of time. And yet, the psalmist and James and Paul are all trying to tell us, judge everything based on the context of eternity, not things that are temporary. Because of this, because God is sovereign, mankind is given to idolatry. It's there in verses 4 through 8. If we go back to the Garden of Eden, one thing becomes crystal clear for us. Mankind has always desired control over our lives and our circumstances. One of Satan's lies uh, was that, well, God knows that when you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then you're going to be like him. Your eyes are going to be open. You're going to know right from wrong or, or good from, from evil. See, mankind has always wanted to be able to call our own shots. The fact that God is sovereign brings us face to face with this truth. We are not in control. And we struggle with that. You know, if we go further in the Old Testament, we go to the base of Mount Sinai. Moses is up on the mountain. He's meeting with God. And the people want to make a representation of God for themselves. And so what do they do? They melt down all the gold and they form it into this calf so that they can worship it. Yet it really wasn't that they wanted to worship a cow. It's that they wanted to create something that they could worship, a work of their own hands to go this is is what I think God is like. And the reality is, no, people aren't making golden calves, but don't we do the same thing today? When we decide how God is, instead of relying on what Scripture tells us, then we are having our own golden calf moment. They fashioned God into the image that they wanted him to be. And this is what makes idolatry so dangerous. It takes a God-given desire, a a desire to worship, and it perverts it into, into whatever image we want it to be. We were made to worship. The problem is we want to worship who we want, when we want, and how we want. We want control instead of trusting that there's a good God who is in control. And I mean, just think about those who have been elevated in our society. <clears throat> Athletes, entertainers, musicians, politicians. What do they do? They all promise us these things. Or they all show us things that we want, that we somehow think that we deserve. I mean, some of those highly sought after people right now, are, they're known as social media influencers. If you can get your stuff, your brand in front of them, and they like you or they like your stuff, then they can instantly shoot it out to hundreds of thousands of followers. And in that moment, then you, cr- you get what you have been craving. The problem is it still leaves you empty in the end. And sadly... The church isn't immune to this. The church isn't immune from misaligned priorities, which leads to misguided worship. 
We've created this celebrity pastor culture where certain pastors are elevated to a place that their character can't withstand. Uh, the reality is a lot of these pastors started off really, really well, but then they got these book deals and all these speaking engagements and more, which caused them to have to keep producing more and more stuff that the people wanted. And the more they gave the people what they wanted, the less they glorified God with what they produced. And this is the danger of idolatry. I'll tell you another way. Uh, and this is going to seem kind of ironic, but stay with me to the end if you don't mind. Another way that this has really infected the church is settling for online worship. Notice I'm saying settling for, okay? I'm not saying that online worship doesn't have a time and a place. It absolutely does. I'm not saying that you should never watch an online service. Obviously, I'm really grateful that you're watching this morning's because sometimes this is the only way that you could do it. The only way I could be with you today is to be able to do things this way. Here's the problem. It comes when we could go, but for the sake of convenience and comfort, we choose not to. When comfort and convenience become the reasons that you go to church or don't go to church, you can bet that comfort and convenience has become your idol. See, you were made to worship. You were made for community. That's why we see the, the doctrine of the Trinity and that desire to worship. We worship God every single day, and we should be a part of a church community that corporately meets together to glorify God, to be equipped by the hearing of the word of God and sent out into our surrounding community to share the gospel of God. So I want to take a quick moment. I want to challenge you here. If you don't have a church that you regularly attend, I want you to start praying about it. Uh, if you need help finding one that's you know within 20 minutes of you, please reach out to me, okay? I, I want to help you find one, okay? Now, until you find that, I want you to know this. Westlake is going to be here. We're going to be praying for you. We're going to be encouraging you. And we're going to equip you just the way that we've been doing, whether it's Facebook or it's YouTube. Okay? But it's necessary for you and I to become a part of that community. The psalmist's point in verses 4 through 8 is really this. For all the idols that we've made, not a single one of them can save us which then leads us to verse 9 and the rest of this chapter. And it's our one point of application. And it's this, trust the Lord. See, only Jesus Christ can save you from your sins. Only Jesus can fulfill that deepest longing you have. Verses 4 through 8 point us to the problem, idolatry. And then verse 9, the psalmist points us to the answer. His name is Jesus. If you've never surrendered to Jesus Christ in faith, you are an idolater. You are worshiping someone or something even right now. Yet God in his grace and in his mercy, in his faithfulness, he is calling you out of your sin into a saving faith in Jesus and you can have it today. If you need to know what does it mean to trust the gospel and to become a Christian or to walk deeper, please, I want to encourage you, email me, pastorjustin at westlakebaptist.org. Or in just a few minutes as we pray, uh, there's going to be a, a subtitle, scroll across, it's prayer at westlakebaptist.org. Okay, both of those emails go directly to me. I would love to be able to pray with you and help you know that you are a child of God. Begin that walk with God. Deepen that work with God. Okay, reach out to me, please. Trust in the Lord to provide for you. We see throughout the, these end verses in the psalm that God has promised to provide for his children. You know, so often what happens is we make compromises because we think we have to because there's no other way. We, we got to make ends meet. Yet the Bible tells us over and over, and it promises those who trust in God 
will be provided for by God. So you don't have to compromise. You simply have to trust and obey. Trust in the Lord to lead you. The prophet Isaiah declares that God knows the end from the beginning. Because he is seated high above it all, as we see in our text, he sees it all. He can see the dangers and the pitfalls that you and I are headed towards. Now listen, trusting in the Lord doesn't mean your life is going to be free from trouble. It means that you're not going to be alone. It means you will walk with the one who knows the right way that you need to go. It means you'll be going with the one who already knows how it's all going to turn out. And it means you'll be going with the one who desires and knows what's best for you and has provided everything you need to come to him, to walk with him until you are with him for all of eternity. So let me ask you this question in closing. What is keeping you from trusting in the Lord today? What is keeping you from surrendering everything you've got? Will you lay that idol down? Will you turn from your sin and turn to Jesus? Again, reach out if I can help you in any way. Would you pray with me? Father, as we close out this time of studying your word, Lord, what a comfort it is to know that you are in control of all things, including when tragedy strikes. Father, I pray for that heart that is discouraged right now. God, that you would remind them that you are a good God who is working all things out for your glory and for your children's good. Lord, whatever is on our minds, whatever is weighing us down, let us surrender it to you today. Father, if there's anyone watching this morning that has never surrendered to you, God, I pray that today, I pray that today is going to be that day, Lord. Father, help us to not just talk about trusting you, but Lord, to live it out every single day as we surrender to you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us in worship. Thank you again for your many prayers. I look forward to being back with you um, on Sunday. And in the meantime, if I can help you, please reach out to me. Love you guys. God bless you.